much here. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16 tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And it's great singing for a Tuesday night of revival. And appreciate you being here tonight. And we've had some uh, heavy services the past two nights. We'll hopefully shift the gear a little bit tonight and challenge you and encourage your heart. And hope you walk away tonight being encouraged uh, by the Word of God. So thank you for being here tonight. And trust you had another good day. And appreciate you making just a revival meeting a priority. And I know there's some uh, men and women who've gone up early today and worked all day long. And you're tired. It was a struggle and a little bit of a battle. Should I stay home tonight and take a rest? But you came anyway. And so, Lord, bless you for that. We commend you for that. And we trust the Lord will honor you for that. So thank you for being here, having your family here. And uh, and uh, appreciate a good, good evening to the live stream folks as well. Don't want to forget about them. And Miss Deborah couldn't make it tonight. And so Brother Denny's running the live stream. So if anything messes up tonight, live stream, Denny Blevins. <laughs> Denny Blevins is running the live stream. And so just uh, in case something goes wrong tonight, you've got to keep them humble. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, mercy. No church like Shenandoah Heights. Amen. No <laughs> place like this place. And that's why I love it. Amen. We'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 16 tonight. We'll deal with a, a familiar text. You'll, you'll know the story once we get into the passage. And I believe there's just some very good applications for our life tonight. So I hope that uh, the Lord will take these truths and lift them out of his word and apply them to your heart. And so whatever decision you need to make tonight, whatever Jesus talks to your heart about, uh, you make that decision. I'll make that decision. And we'll just do what God would have us to do tonight. Can I pray for you before we begin? Father, thank you for my friends tonight that have come out. And Lord, no doubt many are tired here tonight. Many are weary here tonight. And Lord, I know that it takes work to come and be faithful to revival meeting like that, that. That has consecutive nights and consecutive services. And Lord, no doubt we, we feel the weirdness physically, but even the spiritual battle that uh, the devil would say, just, just don't go tonight and just stay home tonight and catch it on live stream. I mean, Lord, I appreciate the folks who fought through that tonight and came anyway. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts tonight, and I pray it would be so personal and so intimate that it would seem as if you were talking to them like they were the only person in the auditorium tonight. Lord, you know what we need here tonight. If it's comfort, give us comfort. If it's a challenge, give us a uh, challenge. If it's conviction, Lord, convict our hearts. Lord, if there is one among us tonight uh, who's come, maybe a visitor, maybe a member, who you've been dealing with their heart about salvation, then we pray tonight would be the night they come to Jesus and make the greatest decision they'll ever make. And Lord, no one can force them to do that. Uh, only the Holy Spirit can draw them to salvation. And Lord, if you draw them tonight, I pray they would take that step and make that decision. Lord, tonight speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. If there was a volume dial on the Bible, I would come to verse number one of our passage tonight and I would turn it up and you would hear the sounds of an old man crying. In fact, the word, for the Bible uses the word mourn in verse number one, and it's the word that means to mourn for someone who has died. So this is heavy mourning. This is deep grief. You say, who's the man that is crying? It's Samuel. The Bible says, and the Lord said to Samuel, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? If you were to go back several chapters, you remember how God's people came to Samuel and says, Samuel, uh, we want to be like everybody else. I mean, we know that we have God in heaven, and he provides for us, and he takes care of us. But we want to be like all the other nations around us. We want to have a king that we can see. I mean, we want to be like everybody else. And by the way, that desire did not just start with you or your kids. Uh, that desire has been around for a long time. They said, we want to be like everybody else. We want to have a king like all the other nations. We want someone who will uh, lead us and uh, will lead us into battle, one that we can see uh, with our own eyes. And so Samuel goes to the Lord and tells the Lord uh, about the people's desire. And uh, the Lord says to give them what they want. Well, how many knows that can be a dangerous thing? Yeah. And so the Lord gave them what they want. And they chose themselves a king. And that king, and that first king, his name was Saul. And you'll remember Saul began well. He started off humble. He could uh, rally the people together. He led them uh, well for a while. But just because you begin well does not automatically guarantee that you are going to end well. Amen. And what a warning for every one of us tonight. 
And finally, he began to rebel against the Lord and sin against the Lord. And finally, the Lord said, I've had enough of this. I have rejected him from being king. The next king will be the man that I choose. Y'all chose the first one. I'm going to choose the next one. And you come here to chapter 16, and we find in verse number 1 that Samuel is distraught. Uh, he is uh, just beside himself. He is mourning. He is grieving. And I think it would be safe to say that Saul was a major disappointment. Would you agree with that tonight? I don't mean to discourage you on a Tuesday night of revival, but throughout life, you're going to have some disappointments in this thing. People will disappoint you, family will disappoint you, work will disappoint you, sometimes that church will get disappointed, and most of all, you'll be disappointed in yourself. And when you and I face disappointments throughout our lives, it is normal and healthy to grieve and to mourn and to weep and to cry. But listen to me, it is not healthy and it is not normal to mourn forever. And that's the implication of the question that the Lord asked Samuel. He says, how long will that mourn for Saul? See, there comes a time in the midst of our disappointment when our expectations are not met. And we find ourselves grieving and mourning. There comes a time when we have to stop mourning and start moving. We have to stop grieving and start going. Because if you spend all your time mourning over Saul, you'll end up missing out on David. Now, that's a word here tonight. Somebody put that on Facebook. Amen. If you spend all your time mourning over Saul, you'll end up missing out on David. And so the Lord breaks through and he speaks to Samuel. And I love the last phrase of verse number one. God says, for I have provided. I have provided. Hey, that's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? In other words, here's Samuel. He's panicking. He says, Lord, I got more questions than answers. I got my back up against the wall. I don't know what we're going to do. This is not what we expected. This is not what we planned. But now this has happened. We don't know what to do. Listen to me. Man panics. God provides. Man panics. God provides. You may want to write that in your margin because you may need that next week. You may need that next month. You may need that next year in your life. Man panics. God provides. He says, for I have provided me a king among his sons. He says, Samuel, I dry your tears up. I blow your nose. I want you to grab the horn and fill it up with oil. And I want you to go down to Bethlehem. I've already provided me a king among Jesse's sons. Hey, listen to me. God already had somebody in the shadows. God already had somebody waiting in the wings. Now, that young man didn't know what was going on. He was about to find out. But God had a plan over all this. And so Samuel packs his bags and he grabs grabs the horn of oil, and he says, yes, Lord, I'll do that. But in verse number two, he begins to panic again, and he says, how can I go if Saul hear it? He will kill me. And isn't it amazing? Oftentimes, and, and uh, God tells us to do something, and we say, yes, sir, Lord. And after we say yes, we start thinking about it. Well, what about what, uh, this? And what if? And what if? And what if? And all of a sudden, we start getting cold feet. Well, the Lord is so good, he intervenes, and he says, well, take a heifer with you. And if anybody stops you, just tell them you're headed to the sacrifice. And, and so he takes the heifer, and finally he gets to, down to Bethlehem. And in verse number 5, he gets there. There's even fear going on there. And they said, come us out peaceably. And he says, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And he finally arrives at Jesse's house, and he calls Jesse uh, to call his boys in to the sacrifice there. Now, I don't know if Samuel let Jesse in on why he was there or what was going on. But nonetheless, Jesse called the older seven boys into the house. And finally, the older boy walks in, and the oldest boy, verse number six, his name was Eliab. And the Bible says that it came to pass when they were come uh, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The oldest son walks in, and Samuel lays his eyes on him, and he says, Surely this is the next king of Israel. I mean, he looks like a king, he sounds like a king, he carries himself like a king. Surely this is the next king. But the Lord says, No, this is not him. I believe when he said that, I, I think that I seen old jaw drop, and he turned to the Lord. He said, Lord, are we looking at the same young man here? I mean, this guy looks like a king, and I, I mean, surely this is the next king. But the Lord said, no, this is not him. 
And then he goes on and gives us some commentary in verse number 7. The Bible says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord says to Samuel, Samuel, I don't look at people the way that you look people. When you look at people, you see the exterior, you see the appearance, you see the outward, you see the outside. But when I look at a person, I look past all that. I look past the exterior. I pass their, uh, their appearance and I look into the integrity and the character of their hearts. Right. And apparently there were some things going on inside of Maya that, uh, that caused the Lord to pass over him. He said, pass. Well, the second son comes in. Verse number 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. Same thing again. Now, this young man looks like a king. He acts like a king. Surely this is the next king of Israel. But the Lord said, pass. That's not him. They go to the third son in verse number, uh, verse number nine. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, "Neither has the Lord chosen this." Same thing again. Same, uh, same song, uh, same verse. Surely this is him. But the Lord says, "No, that is not him." Pass. That's not the one. They go through this uh, several more times until all seven sons pass before Samuel, and each time it is no, 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 no. They get down to the end. And I'm going to see that Samuel is just exasperated. And he says, Jesse, I mean, for crying out loud, do you have any more sons here? He says, well, I got one more. Yeah. But he's the youngest. Yeah. And he's out back taking care of the sheep. Now, just think a moment. If Jesse knew why Samuel was there, then he would have called in the sons that he thought was the most likely candidates to be the next king of Israel. In other words, by, by what he did there, he was saying, Samuel, if you're looking for the next king of Israel, it's going to be one of these seven that I have right here. I mean, I got one out back, but I promise you, he's the least likely candidate. If you're looking for the next king, it's going to be one of these seven that I passed before you. It's got to be one of these seven. But may I say this tonight? God's choices are surprising. He says, well, I got one boy out back, but he's the youngest, and he's keeping the sheep. Samuel says, call him in here. Somebody goes out back and hollers and says, I say, uh, David, come on in the house. They want you in here. And Dad, David, what most of the commentators and scholars would believe was 14 years old at this point, walks into the house, has no clue what's going on, and no doubt smells like sheep, has been outside all day long, and he walks into the house. And uh, he's about to receive the shock of his life. And the family's about to receive the shock of their life. And when he walks in and Samuel lays his eyes on him, the Lord whispers and said, that is him. That is the next king. And I think in that moment, he had the very same conversation he had with the first son. He turned to the Lord and said, Lord, are we looking at the same one? And the Lord said, yes, that is him. Anoint him to be the next king. And I can see the old man hobbles across the room, and he takes that horn of oil, and he dives to pour it on David's head. And it runs down his face, and it runs down the back of his neck. And I believe he leaned in real close, and he whispered in his ear, and he said, David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. Listen to me. God's choices are surprising. It's surprising at who God chooses to use and at who God does not choose to use. Well, we see this all the time in youth ministry, at youth camps and Christian schools and church a youth groups. You look at a young person, and here's a young person who is sharp. They carry themselves well. They have a good personality. They have natural leadership abilities. I mean, they can stand up. They have good speaking skills. And we look at that young person, and we say, my soul, that young person is going to do great things for God. You may be surprised. But you look at another young person that is backwards and introverted, can't carry on a conversation, can't look you in the eye, he can't tell jokes, he doesn't even get jokes. I mean, the kid is just struggling through life, and we say that young person will never do anything for God. You may be surprised. Amen. Because God's choices are surprising. Amen. 20 years from now, can I say to the young people of this church, 20 years from now, you'll look back and you'll be surprised at who God used and who God did not use. Yeah. You say, what was it? Apparently, the Bible says he was a good-looking young person. The Bible says that. Uh, but, but apparently there was nothing in and of David, according to his own family, that would have led them to believe that he would be king material. But apparently, uh, God saw some things that nobody else saw. 
And I believe there are some, some clues, some subtle clues and some not so subtle clues in this passage and surrounding this passage that reveal to you and I tonight some characteristics and qualities in David's life. And I believe it was those qualities that attracted God to heal and led God to look down at heaven and to say, I can use somebody like that. Tonight I'm going to preach and encourage, I praise an encouraging message entitled, The Kind of People God Uses. The Kind of People God Uses. You say, Brother Taylor, in 2020 when God looks down from heaven and he's looking for people that he can use, uh, he's not looking for perfect people. Can I get a witness right there? He's not looking for uh, people that have charismatic personalities. He's not looking for uh, all the time beautiful people and people that look good in the cover of a magazine. But there are certain characteristics that he is looking for, and those are the important qualities. You say, what kind of people is God looking for to use today? First of all, he's looking for spiritual people. He's looking for spiritual people. If you were to go back to chapter 13 and verse number 14, after Saul rebels against the Lord, uh, yeah, Saul rebels against the Lord, uh, and the Lord tells Samuel, I've rejected him from being king. The next man that will be king will be the man that I choose, and the man that I choose in chapter 13, verse 14, will be a man after my own heart. And when you come to chapter 16, we find that that man, that teenager, that shepherd boy, David, was the man after God's own heart. You say, Brother Taylor, I kind of generally understand what, what that phrase means, being a, a man or a woman or a teenager after God's own heart. I got a general idea, but, but what exactly does that phrase mean? It means this. It means that your life is in harmony with God. I said, your life is in harmony with God. When God says, go, you go. When God says, stop, you stop. When God says turn left, you turn left. When God says turn right, you turn right. What's important to God is important to you. What God loves, you love. What God cares about, you care about. What grieves him, grieves you. That's what it means to be a man or a woman or a teenager after God's own heart. That's what it means to be spiritual. Amen. Can I ask you a question tonight? Is your life tonight in harmony with God? Don't you appreciate the fact that a young man, maybe at 8, 9, 10 years old, maybe in the early preteen years of 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, here was a young man who made a decision for himself that if his family wasn't going to live for God, and if none of his friends are going to live for God, and if nobody else in Bethlehem was going to walk with God, he himself was going to be spiritual and develop a relationship and have a walk with God. And can I say this? No one else can make that decision for you. Your pastor can't read the Bible for you. Your pastor can't pray for you. You. At some point, you have to make a personal decision that I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to be close to God. And can I say tonight, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. You are as close to God tonight as you want to be. And if you're not as close as you used to be or you'd like to be, God did not move. At some point, you have to take responsibility for your own relationship with God. And we understand, being a Christian, this is a community project. We need the church. We need preachers, and we need teachers, and we need pastors that will uh, teach us and preach to us and encourage us. We need Christian friends that will keep us accountable. But at some point, it is your decision uh, to decide whether or not you are going to walk with God. Yeah. And David, as a young man, said, I'm going to walk with him. And I'm going to learn to worship him. And I'm going to let him be God in my life. Well, that was a good decision. We live in a world today, and some of you may work with people like this. And this may be a, a more than just a joke, but a philosophy on your job. People say this all the time. Well, just fake it till you make it. Just fake it till you make it. That may work for a little while out there in the world, but that don't work with God. Listen to me. You're not going to fake it with God. You're not going to fake walking with God. You're not going to fake truly living with God. Because you may fake everybody else out, but you're not going to fake God. He knows whether or not you love him. He knows whether or not you spend time with him. He knows whether or not you love what he loves. He knows whether or not you will you increase him. I creep you. He knows whether or not we are truly spiritual. God is looking for someone that is spiritual. And can I say that there's two times you say, well, Brother Taylor, I mean, I've been kind of standing at the edge of the pool this thing, and I kind of stick my toe in every once in a while, and I kind of dabble with it, and I kind of play with it, but I've not got all the way in yet. And Brother Taylor, maybe it's just too late for me. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm in my 50s and 60s. I'm in the second half of my, maybe it's too late for me to start living for God. Listen to me. It's never too late. Somebody said there's two best times to plant a tree. Number one was 20 years ago. 
And number two is today. You say, my life had been in harmony with God. That can change tonight. I've not been walking with God. That can change tonight. I've not been reading the Bible faithfully. That can change tonight. I don't have a prayer life. That can change tonight. Yes. And you can walk away from a revival meeting tonight and determine in your heart and purpose in your heart that if no one else in my family is going to live for God, if no one else at work is going to live for God, if no one else in, in, in Waynesboro is going to live for God, I'm going to walk and live for God. He's looking for people that are spiritual. Is your life in harmony with God? Notice number two, not only was David spiritual, but he was also humble. He was also humble. You're saying, Brother Taylor, what in the world uh, did that 14-year-old, I mean, just a teenager, didn't even have his driver's license yet. <laughs> what did he do when God anointed him, uh, when, when Samuel anointed him to be the next king of Israel? Here's what he didn't do. He didn't strap a crown on his head and walk around and start barking orders. He didn't throw a parade downtown on Main Street to celebrate himself. You say, well, well what, what, what did he do? In the next passage, the spirit of the Lord departs from Saul. And the evil spirit comes on him. And he needs some relief. And he calls for a musician. He says, get somebody in here that can play an instrument because I need some music to soothe my soul. And somebody spoke up and said, well, we know somebody. They said, who is it? It's a young boy named David. And by the way, never discount the skills that God has given you in your life. Because you never know how God might just bring those around one day. If you play an instrument, learn to play that instrument. If you got some skill, develop that skill. Can I say this just a time out tonight? And I appreciate the young, all the adults that are saying, but I appreciate especially the young people, teenagers that have played instruments and sang this week. Yeah. Develop that music for God. You want as many tool, tools in your toolbox to, to serve the Lord with as possible. I wish I would have kept on taking a piano lessons as a teenager and as a kid. Because it's not a church that we go to, not a week goes by, that we don't pull up. And they say, Brother Taylor, do you and your wife play and sing, the, uh, sing and play the piano? I said, she sings, but I don't play the piano. Can I say, I wish I played the piano. You want as many tools in your toolbox to serve God with as possible. That was free. They said, we know a young man. His name's David. They said, send for him. And notice what it says in verse 19. When they went to go look for David to come play the music. Verse number 19 in chapter 16. Wherefore, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son. Notice this phrase. Which is with the sheep. Say, what in the world was he doing there? He was anointed to be the next king. Chapter 17, please. Verse number 12. The, bat, the, the, the Bible is introducing the battle of Goliath, uh, God's people with Goliath here. And the Bible says in verse number 12, Now David was the son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. Uh, verse number 14, And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Drop down to verse number 17. The Bible says that uh, Jesse sent David to take the food and to check on his brothers there in the battlefield. But verse number 20 says... And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. It seems like any time they needed David to do anything else, they had to run and pull him off of the sheep. You say, what's the, well, what's the point tonight? The point is, even though he was, he was anointed to be the next king, he went right back to keep taking care of the sheep. You say, what's the point? The point is this. He never got too big to do the little things. Amen. You say, I don't think it's a big deal. It was a big deal to God. Never get too big to do the little things. I love the stories of the late 1800s. Leo Moody had his Bible conference over in Northfield, Massachusetts, and he invited the English pastors over from England to attend the conference, and they came over. And after the service was over, they retired to a, a dormitory style, style housing there. And uh, as they, the, those English pastors went to bed, they all left their uh, shoes out in front of the doors of their room and over in, 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 in that uh, in England and there, during that day the, it was customary to leave your shoes out in the hallway for the hall servants to clean that night. But the problem was this was in England there was no hall servants. So Dill Moody walked the halls and realized what was going on here and so he went to find some, some of the young seminary students there and uh, began to ask for help but his pleas for help were uh, met with silence and indifference. 
young preachers. And so when everybody else went to bed, T.L. Moody, the great evangelist, the man who shook two continents for Christ, went around and scooped up the shoes and took them to his room and began to clean those shoes. And it would have gone unknown until, except a friend walked in and surprised him and discovered uh, what was taking place. I think one of the reasons God used D.L. Moody was because D.L. Moody never got too big to do the little things. Let me say this. You're not too big to help with the laundry. You're not too big to help with the dishes. You're not too big to feed Fifi or whatever you have at the house. Listen to me. You can be a blessing. You say, oh, that's just at church. No, it's at home. It's at work. It's all through life. You say, I don't think it's a big deal. I'm telling you right now, it's a big deal. Amen. We were at church some time ago in Oklahoma. We preached on it. It was kickoff revival. We preached Sunday morning. Afterwards, we had dinner on the grounds. And, and uh, anybody that was trained with, with any sense of decency, when something's over, you help stick around and, and clean up. Amen. And that's just most of us were raised that way. So the meal was over, and I just... Well, I was trained this way. It's this way I was raised. And, and I appreciate uh, coming from a, a ministry background that was uh, 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 servant leadership was pushed on us. And I think we wouldn't just preach. It was modeled in front of me. I'm grateful for that. Yeah. And so we just started picking up tables and chairs like usual. And, care, and a dear lady came over and said, Brother Taylor, uh, you, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, you're the guest speaker. I said, no, ma'am. That's exactly why I should be doing this. Yeah. Hardly a week, don't go, don't go by to revival somewhere. We're not in the back of the church in a fellowship hall eating food that people graciously bring for the service. We're grateful for that. But afterwards, it's time to clean up, and you're carrying tables and chairs. And usually on the other end of that table, there's a youth pastor, an assistant pastor. And as we're carrying that table, I'll, I'll reach up and slap him and sit. And just half joking, half not say this. I say, ha ha, you know, brother, you never, you never graduate from the table and chair ministry. <laughs> but some people do. Listen to me. God uses humble people. Amen. When you get to the place in your life when certain jobs are below you and you're too big for that, then you may be too big to be used. The Bible says that Jesus, he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Being a servant. Being a servant. A humble servant. When, when they needed someone to take care of the sheep, they was there. When they needed someone to play the music, he was there. When they needed someone to take the food to the battlefield, he was there. Always serving. Always serving. All, and God said, I can use somebody like that. Amen. Number one, he's looking for people that are spiritual. Their lives are in harmony with God. Number two, he's looking for someone that was humble. He never got too big to do the little things. And number three, he's looking for someone that was faithful. He's looking for people that are faithful. Now, I want to back up tonight and take just a bird's eye view and make some observations out of chapter 16 and make some points that we'll close her down tonight. First of all, David was faithful in obscurity. He was faithful in obscurity. The Bible says that he was raised up and, and lived the early years of his life in Bethlehem. Now, listen, you and I, because of our Lord Jesus Christ and because of David and even at Christmas, uh, Christmas time, we all know Bethlehem. We're all familiar with Bethlehem. That was not the case case when he was growing up. If he was out about traveling and, and uh, someone said, hey, where are you from? He would have said this. Oh, you've never heard of it before. Some of you are raised in a town like that. Some of you live in a town like that. Amen. So you understand that. And uh, that's the kind of town and place that he was raised in. Listen to me. Before anybody knew his name, before anybody knew where he was from, on the back side of a pasture, just watching sheep, listen to me, he was, dead, he was faithful day in and day out. Listen to me, in the shadows, before anybody ever knew him. Listen to me, in private, before anybody ever knew his name, he was faithful there. And I believe God looked down, and he said, if that young boy can be faithful in private, I believe I can trust him to be faithful in public as well. You may feel in your life, you say, Brother Taylor, I'm trying to live for the Lord, but I'm the only one at work. I'm the, I feel like I'm, I'm in the, I'm the Waynesboro, Virginia. I mean, where in the world is this place at? I mean, no one knows who I am. No one knows where, where I'm at. I mean, Brother Taylor, I don't even know if this is making a difference. Listen to me. You just keep being faithful. Mm -hmm. 
Because if nobody else is watching, there is one that's watching, and his name is the Lord. Amen. You just be faithful in obscurity and behind the scenes and in the shadows, because I promise you, somebody is watching, somebody is taking notes, someone is keeping record, and the Bible says that God is not unrighteous to forget our labor of love. He was faithful in obscurity. Number two, he was faithful with monotony. He was faithful with monotony. Think about it. As a shepherd, it was the same thing day in and day out. Lead the sheep, feed the sheep, protect the sheep, lead them to the green pastures, lead them to the still waters. It was the same thing every day, day in, day out, but he faithfully did it. Amen. Listen to me. God's looking for people to just be faithful with the monotony. The day in, day out, old school, old fashioned, faithful. Listen to me. It matters how you fill those reports out at work. Yeah. It matters how you carry out those assignments throughout life. Amen. And David did that. Amen. And the backside of that pastor, as he watched over those sheep, that was God's training ground for him. And God instilled character into him. And I believe as God watched him day in and day out, he looked at a heaven and said, Yes. If he can be faithful with the little things, then I believe that I can trust him to be faithful with the big things. Amen. Faithful in obscurity. Faithful in monotony. And then last thing, number three, faithful with reality. Faithful with reality. You say, Brother Taylor, here's a, just a young a shepherd boy who obviously I love the Lord and spent time worshiping the Lord and singing those songs to him. I mean, Brother Taylor, when I think about David, I just kind of consider him as maybe a, a, someone who just walked around with his heads in the clouds all day. Oh, no. When you come to chapter 17, we find the battle with Goliath. And when David shows up with the food to check on his brothers, as his father asking him to do, he hears the insults and the taunts of Goliath coming from the other side of the valley of Elah. And he begins to inquire why nobody's done anything about this giant yet. <laughs> and they give off the excuses, and finally, David said, well, if no one else is going to take care of him, I'll take care of him. And they begin to scorn him and ridicule him. They say, yeah, 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 shepherd boy, you're 14 years old. What do you know about taking care of a giant? He said, oh, let me tell you. Back in Bethlehem, on the backside of the pastures, when I was watching my father's sheep, there was a day that a bear showed up. And there was a day that a lion showed up. And with God's help, I overcame the lion. And I overcame the bear. And I know with God's help, because of the victories of yesterday, I can have some victory today over this giant. Yes. Listen to me, friend. If you don't learn to overcome the lions and the bears in your life today, then you'll never overcome the giants in your life tomorrow. You better learn now how to uh, overcome that sin. You better learn now how to uh, persevere through that trial. You better learn today how to get your prayers answered because I promise you there's some giants that are waiting in the next chapter. Yes. And friend, that's how the Christian life works. God puts us through experiences that force us to rely on him. But through those difficult situations, he teaches us that through him we can overcome those situations and we can have victory. And little by little and chapter by chapter, he begins to grow us and we become more dependent on him. And our faith grows. Yeah. Yeah. Romans says there's experience and with experience comes hope. Amen. Can I say this? There was things in our first year of evangelism that would happen, and I would go days, and I couldn't sleep. But now in year six, the things that kept me up in year one, they don't bother me no more in year six. Why? Because it's been not because of me. God had to drive me through some experiences kicking and screaming. I learned the hard way. But little by little, God brings you the circumstances of life, and he proves his faithfulness, Amen. and he prepares us for the next chapter. Amen. Tonight, I'm here to tell you, when God looks down on Waynesboro, Virginia, and he's looking for somebody that he can use, listen to me, he's going to have a hard time using someone who's not, who's not spiritual. He's going to have a hard time using someone who's not humble. He's going to have a hard time using someone who's not faithful. But if you're spiritual, and you're humble, and you're faithful, God says, I can use somebody like that. Father, thank you for the example of David. 
Well, the Bible says these things are written aforetime for our learning. And Lord, there are some truths here tonight that we need to learn and apply and internalize and live out in our lives. Lord, I believe it's the heart of everyone here tonight. We want our lives to be used. But Lord, our lives have to be usable. If you're here tonight and say, Brother Taylor, at one time my life was in harmony with God. But I feel that maybe through the course of this year, some circumstances that I've gone through, I feel like I've gotten out of harmony with God. And I'm not as close to Him as I used to, but tonight that's going to change. Pray for me. If that's you, would you raise your hand tonight? Brother Taylor, I want to be spiritual. Brother Taylor, I, I can sense, listen to me, we all do this. It all happens. It happens to all of us. You say, Brother Ty, I feel the, the, the pride creeping into my heart. And instead of running to needs, I find myself passing thy needs. Brother Ty, would you pray that God would keep me humble? If that's you and I, would you raise your hand? Brother Ty, I never want to get too big to do the little things. I want God to keep me humble. How many says, Brother Taylor, sometimes I get discouraged. I try to be faithful, but I get discouraged. Brother Taylor, pray for me. That day in, day out, in obscurity, if no one else knows about it, I want to be faithful in the private places. I want to be faithful with the little things. Brother Taylor, I just want to be faithful because I know that God is watching. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I just want to be faithful. Father, thank you for these friends that have gathered here tonight. Thank you again for your word. Help us to respond to what you dealt with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand our feet tonight.